All right. Um, so starting today, uh, we proceed with the second part of the course. And as I said last time, the purpose here is to put it simply to demonstrate the usefulness of continuum mechanics. And uh, let me also say that the purpose is not to teach these topics. So I'm going to cover, the plan is to cover more or less five special topics, right, as applications of continuum mechanics. But um, we're not trying to teach you any one of these topics. It's just to give you some ideas and uh, at the same time see how the language of continuum mechanics plays a role in these, um, in these special topics. And uh, I should also say, so, I'm, so, so these topics, some of them you will see they are almost undergraduate level. Uh, some of them for sure are not. But in any case, uh, I should say I wouldn't call myself an expert in the sense that I'm not somebody who has dedicated his whole research and life to any one of these topics. For sure, I have experience in some of them. But uh, you will see that even if they are rather simple looking topics, and the first one, for instance, is rigid by dynamics, for sure you have some idea about it. Once we get to a certain level, you will see that there are certain intricacies that do require some level of, let me say, experience or expertise, right? And you will see that with every one of these special topics. Again, however, our goal is just to see how continuum mechanics plays a role in sort of bringing some ideas clearly to the foreground so you see the major problems in any one of these topics, right? So it condenses, it, it provides you with, a, I think, a clear picture of what is going on, okay? Um, so the first topic is rigid body dynamics. All right. Uh, this is the simplest thing we could start with because there is for sure motion, but there is absolutely no deformation. We don't really have to worry about stresses. We don't have to worry about deformations apart from some rotation, so there's not going to be any strain. Uh, and what's nice is we know precisely what the motion function is. Okay? Um, so let, let's start by drawing a, a, our picture that we often draw perhaps a somewhat simplified object. Uh, it's going to move. This is its reference configuration. And then we have the current configuration. And here on this picture, I'm going to um, introduce a lot of vectors, OK, position vectors. So it's going to be a busy picture. So that's our, let's say, observer, or our origin, if you like. Um, so we have, as usual, uh, any point on the object. And that any point is subject, or we find its new location by knowing what the um, motion is, right? So the position of the point on the reference camp configuration that is capital X. So let me pick the locations carefully. As I said, it's going to be a busy picture. So let's see. This one is small x. All right. right. Now, as soon as I uh, had this picture, I will go ahead and define something that, of course, you are familiar with. I will define a center of mass. Okay. So I'll abbreviate with that with CM. So when you see CM, it's going to refer to the center of mass. And graphically on the object, I will denote it with that symbol. Um, and it is defined as, as you know, so it's the integral, for instance, we have a center of mass on the reference configuration, 1 over mass, rho naught, referential position vector, d capital V. Um, the density itself does not need to be uniform. It can be different throughout the object. And then on the current configuration, a similar integral. 
So the center of mass, let's put that on our picture. Originally, let's say it's here. And uh, on the deformed configuration, it's there. Okay. Um, so the location of the center of mass, that is capital X bar or small x bar. So bar eventually will have to do with always the center of mass. I'm not using a superscript CM, let's say X superscript M, because that's going to make things a little bit busy. So we'll have two things that indicate an object having to do with the center of mass. One of them will be a superscript CM. The other one will be a bar. Um, uh, so, 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 but I think the context, again, will help us easily follow. Um, how things proceed as I do the derivations, okay? So that's the picture, right? So now having introduced those quantities, I am going to, I can easily define a number of other objects. So for instance, we can define the relative position vector So with respect to the center of mass, and that will simply be, so my notation is as before, so relative position vector is going to be R. I'm going to put a bar to indicate that that's the relative position vector with respect to the center of mass. That's x minus x bar. And similarly, relative position vector on the reference configuration is going to be capital X minus capital X bar. Okay? Now, you'll recall that we had a similar notation before. We picked a point O, and we defined the relative position vector with respect to that point. That point had location x naught. The relative position vector was r naught. Okay? So let's also throw in such a point over here. That is our point O, and that is x naught and that one would be R naught, okay? And of course, we can draw also the relative position vectors with respect to the center of mass, small r and capital R bar, okay? So in terms of definitions and pictorially, those are our vectors. Okay. Um, and, right, so, so pretty much we have uh, identical quantities or s related quantities on spatial and reference configurations, but the reference configuration is, uh, is a, has, has some extra things like that position vector, but apart from that, that is the absolute position of the point. This is the position of the center of mass. This is the position with respect to the center of mass, and that's the position with respect to the point that I picked. What's special about that point? As usual, I'm going to assume that it is uh, fixed, all right? Now, I'm going to introduce yet another position vector. And for that purpose, let me move this x a little bit to the right. Okay, And that vector is this one. It is the relative position of the center of mass with respect to that point. So I'm going to indicate that with R bar naught. Okay. Okay. And eventually, if I have to at some point use R bar naught, I will say things like R bar naught is equal to X bar minus X naught, et cetera. So by looking at that picture, at this picture, I will. Um, 
formulate or express these vectors in terms of the others, okay, for derivation purposes. Okay, so questions about the picture. Because I won't need it. I'm just introducing. So these two things are, I don't have them on the reference configuration because I don't need them. Okay. There is no reason why you wouldn't define them. OK. Questions so far? Okay. I'll have to refer to this picture, and I doubt if I raise this board, I'll, uh, I'll be able to draw it quickly again, so I'll try to keep it uh, throughout the lecture. Now, what's special about rigid body motion? Well, what's special is I know exactly what the motion is. So rigid body motion is uh, one where the current location of a material point at any given time is expressed explicitly in terms of some proper orthogonal tensor which represents rotation, its initial position, plus some additional vector that could possibly depend on time. Okay. So this vector exclusively has to do with translation and uh, this one has to do with rotation. Um, Q is proper orthogonal. So notice that if you calculate the deformation gradient partial X over partial capital X, you get Q out of it. And proper and, and that's, that's expected because, in general, it's F equals R U, but if U is not identity, right, then there would be a strain associated with it. We're talking about rigid body dynamics. There is no strain, right? So R is equal to Q, the rotation tensor. Okay, so F is equal to Q, and any strain goes without saying is equal to uh, zero, properly defined strain, and determinant of F is one, okay? Uh, which means that the density at any point does not change. Okay. Again, the density does not have to be constant throughout the material, throughout the body, uh, but its value is preserved at any point through time. Now, the way we're going to proceed uh, with rigid body dynamics, this topic, is I'm going to prove a series of identities that clarify how we work with rigid body dynamics. So I have developed some identities, and eventually you will see that um, a system emerges, a, a result emerges, which essentially describes the motion of this rigid body dynamics without explicitly referring to the motion of the particles, but referring to the object as a whole and defining quantities that, uh, let me say, characterize that object, like the moment of inertia tensor, et cetera. These are things that you are familiar with. So let us proceed with these steps. The first one is I will show now that the position with respect to the center of mass simply rotates. So some of these proofs are short, some of them are somewhat lengthier. So, right? So this is the position with respect to the center of mass. What we're saying is that this vector, relative position vector, is, you already see it here, it rotates, right? And that rotation is precisely described through Q, okay? So don't write because this is a very short one. Let's do this first one together. So I'm going to start by expressing R bar because that's the quantity that I want to reach a conclusion about. And if you look at that picture uh, or our definition right here, you'll see that R bar is X minus uh, X bar. And I'm going to now go ahead and plug in the expression for X, which is Q X plus C. And then I'll throw in the definition of x bar, which is minus 1 over m integral over uh, r rho q x plus c dv. 
right? So that's the definition of x bar, and I've thrown in what x is, right? So um, then I combine some quantities. There is a qx over here, and there is a q-related integral over here. So that's 1 over m integral over r rho qx dv, right? And then there are C-related quantities. There is one C minus 1 over M rho, sorry, R rho C dB. Okay. So what I've done is simply I've regrouped um, those terms, right? So now this one is easy, right? Because C is a constant. I can take it outside the integral, and the result is essentially equal to C, so these two terms will cancel each other out. Now, on the other hand, Q is a constant, so that will come outside of the integral. Q multiplying 1 over M rho X. That is precisely the definition of the center of mass on the reference configuration. Okay? So that is equal to Q 1 over M R rho x d v, okay? So I'm going to pull this onto the reference configuration. I can easily do so, right? Now you see perhaps the picture better, right? And this here is capital X bar. So that's equal to 0, and this is q x minus x bar. And x minus x bar is the relative position with respect to the center of mass on the reference configuration, and hence our result is proved. Okay? So the relative position with respect to the center of mass is subjected to the rotation that is appearing in the motion function. Okay? So please complete that much. So note that that result is specific to rigid body dynamics. It does not hold in general. You can always define a center of mass, but the motion of the center of mass with respect to, so the relative position with respect to center of mass is not always subject to, to some pure rotation because in general objects deform. And that's very easy to see. First of all, in a deformable object, uh, so that's the distance of a point to the center of mass. That's a certain distance. If I take the object and somehow stretch it significantly, one can imagine that the position of the same point with respect to the center of mass is going to be different. And we know that pure rotation preserves length, so the length of this thing is the same as the length of that vector, right? Uh, and therefore, if the object is deformable, those lengths are also subject to change, right? So that's specific to rigid body dynamics. But what I'm about to show now is true in general. In fact, I'm going to show items two and three that are always true. Okay. So let's write that here. Always true. Okay. And the conclusion we'd like to reach is that the total linear momentum of the object can be expressed in terms of its mass times the velocity of the center of mass. Okay. Okay, so V bar indicates X bar dot. And it follows that uh, F is equal to P dot. Let's write it like this. So the total linear momentum is total mass times the velocity of the center of mass. And therefore, it follows that if I'd like to calculate the rate of change of the velocity of the center of mass, or in other words, the acceleration at the center of mass, that's equal to, that obeys 
Newton's law, law of motion, okay, in this simple um, expression, right? And why does that work? Well, that follows actually from Euler's laws of motion because whether the object is deformable or not, the total, the rate of change of, right, total linear momentum, so, so this part is easy, by linear momentum balance, we know that the rate of change of total linear momentum is equal to force and p dot is equal to m v bar dot because m is a constant, right? We assume the closed system, so the mass is not changing, and hence the result, right? So the second part follows from linear momentum balance, so all we have to show is uh, the first part. So notice, what does this result as a whole eventually enable us to do? So this, in fact, is our, in some sense, major result here. So what that allows us to do is to update the location of the center of mass, okay? I have an object, it's rigid, or it may not be rigid, but eventually we're in rigid, but dynamics is a special topic, so that will be our goal. We have an object and it will be rigid and it's subjected to some certain force. Uh, and perhaps some moments, so it's going to move and it's going to rotate in space. So if I'd like to describe the motion of that object, I have to find out how its center of mass changes its position and how it changes its orientation. So this first equation actually immediately lets me update the location of the center of mass because then this would be the second derivative of the location of the center of mass with respect to time. So x bar double dot m is equal to the force that I apply. I can integrate that through time with your preferred integrator, right? So that accomplishes one part of the goal, right? And then for rigid body, now I have to also afterwards concentrate on how this object changes its orientation. I have to also describe that orientation, okay? But at this stage, again, I highlight this result holds in general, right? So we'll come back to these remarks once again later on. So let me show this very quickly again, if you like, uh, because it's a short proof, do not uh, write at this stage. I'll just calculate the total linear momentum. I'll invoke the definition. So it's the sum of the incremental momentum of the particles, right, dm times velocity. Um, and remember how we obtained that, actually, uh, or I will re-express that. We did, we, this is the definition. So this is x dot, okay? Now this is not a trick that we've done before, but it's a trick that I've mentioned and used before. So whenever you have a time derivative of an object that appears in an integral and rho dv also appears, because you can pull back to the reference and then push forward again to the current configuration, this operation is effectively equivalent to taking this time derivative and placing, on, placing it on that object. So, and when you do that, you get V, okay? So that is equal to this, right? So now that equality holds, and I will do a simple manipulation here, multiply and divide through m, and this quantity over here is nothing but the position of the center of mass. m is not changing. I can take that outside of the time derivative, and by definition, x bar dot is v bar, and I'm done. Okay, so I've expressed the total linear momentum as total mass times the velocity of the center of mass. And I haven't assumed anything about the motion, right? It is deformable in general. So please proceed with writing. Questions about anything that we've covered so far? Any question? Okay, so then let's proceed with the third one, which is also always true. Now, let me first, so that one had to do with the linear momentum balance, and therefore, 
what I'm about to write now will have to do with the angular momentum balance. First, let me remind you before stating what, I'm, what I want to show. Originally, the um, angular momentum balance reads as follows. Well, it says that if you calculate the total angular momentum of the object with respect to a stationary point, not, and it has to be so, that's the statement of Euler's laws of motion, okay? Um, and if you then calculate its rate of change, then it is equal to the net moment that you exert to the object with respect to that same stationary point. That is the original statement, okay? So that point in our picture over here, it's there, right? That's our point. Now, if you choose any other point, that's also fine. The statement still holds. So the choice of this point, as long as it's stationary, it's arbitrary, right? And that's also something uh, we've discussed very shortly. But now, if you choose a point, for instance, another point, let's say a point that is attached to the object, for instance, that point, okay? So now that point will move with the object, and if you cal continuously calculate right, the angular momentum of the object with respect to this point, which moves in time, and then you calculate its rate of change, and then you also calculate at any point the moment that the object experiences with respect to that point, you will see that the two sides don't match. Okay? So if you choose a point that is not stationary in general, the equality, the expression, rate of change of the total angular momentum with respect to that point is equal to the moment about that point, won't hold, right? Except for a special point which moves, which happens to be the center of mass, okay? So we'd like to show, therefore, that the Angular momentum balance holds with respect to the center of mass. So perhaps for sure this is something that you've shown in uh, undergraduate dynamics, most probably in 2D, but let's go ahead and quickly do that in a fully 3D setting. Okay? And in fact, again, I highlight we're not assuming anything about deformability. Okay, so this is a fully deformable object. Um, all right, so let's split the proof into two parts. First, I'll try to find out what the angular momentum with respect to the stationary point looks like and see if I can somehow condense out this term, the angular momentum with respect to the center of mass. Okay, so um, So the angular momentum with respect to x naught is the moment of the momentum of the particles, right, summed up. And now you can have a look at, um, once again, to the picture. So I won't always refer to this picture, but let's do it once more. I'd like to express r naught in this case as x minus x naught. Okay? So I'm going to throw that in there. This is x minus x naught. And then, once again, I move over here. Um, I would like to express x as um, x, sorry, as r bar plus x bar. Okay? I throw that in there as well. So r bar plus x bar, that's now x minus x naught, so altogether that's equal to uh, r naught. Good. So I throw in that expression over here. Now the whole thing is r bar plus x bar minus x naught cross rho v uh, dv. Now, I have three vectors here, an r bar, a x bar, and an x bar, x, x naught. r bar, x bar, and an x naught, okay? Now, x naught is something that has got nothing to do with the object. So that is a constant in terms of integration. I can't take it outside. x bar is the position of the center of mass. It belongs, again, to the object, 
It's got nothing to do with the individual particles of the object. So for integration purposes, that's also a constant. Uh, the only thing that depends on the position in the domain is R bar. Because for this point, that's R bar. For that point, that's R bar. For that point, that's R bar. So it changes with the point that I pick. So R bar has to stay in the integral, but the others I can take outside. So I have X bar minus X naught cross rho V dV plus integral over R, R bar cross rho V dV. So now if you look at these terms, right? So this, the first term in the integral, that is the total linear momentum, which we indicate with P. And the second term is the moment of the momenta of the particles with respect to the center of mass. And this is the definition of HCM, the total angular momentum with respect to the center of mass. So that's an expression that we now put to one side. Okay? So if you haven't already done so, please write. OK, so that's what I like to show. That's my given. And I've done something about the right-hand sides. I've expressed one in terms of the other. So now I'll work on the left-hand side, on the moment, and see where that takes me. So likewise, now I will express the moment with respect to the stationary point. I will try to express it in terms of the moment with respect to the center of mass. So the moment with respect to the stationary point, so that is the moment of the forces, incremental forces, with respect to the stationary point. So we have volume forces and we have on the surface um, attraction. So again, I'm going to, instead of, in place of R0, I'm going to write down what I have previously written. So that is equal to R bar plus x bar minus x naught. Okay, so in place of R naught, I'm writing this alternative expression, cross rho b dv plus del r tda. So by the same argument now, if I look at both of these integrals, what you see is you have x bar minus x naught, x bar minus x naught. Both of these, for integration purposes, they are constants. I take them outside. So we have in both terms an x bar minus x naught crossing either rho b or TDA. So that's one term. And then I have the remaining terms, which is r bar rho b plus del r r bar cross t. So then you have to interpret what the terms are individually, right? So that's a constant. This one over here is the total force that I exert on the object. So that is F. And this one is the moment of the incremental forces with respect to the center of mass. And that is, by definition, MCM, okay, the moment total moment with respect to center of mass. Okay, great. So now I have also, similar to the total angular momentum, expressed the moments or related the moments with respect to the center of mass and with respect to the stationary point, which pretty much actually concludes our proof. So um, the previous expression is now what I will continue with. Let me pick a different color. So previously, I had found out that H0 is equal to, so I'm just writing down the result from the previous board. Uh, 
That's the earlier relationship. And now I'm going to go ahead and calculate this rate of change. Okay? So that is going to be the rate of change of that term and the rate of change of the total angular momentum with respect to the center of mass. Right? So that's equal to um, x bar dot. Okay? Minus x naught dot, but x naught doesn't change. It's a stationary point. Cross p uh, plus x bar minus x naught cross p dot plus h dot cm. Good. Now, what's this term equal to? Why? And? Because, OK, so P, through our first result, is equal to M V bar. That's what we have shown. And this is the definition of V bar. So we make use of the result from item 1, and that first term drops. And so that's equal to 0. Good. So let's put that to one side and also, by the way, realize that P dot is nothing but F. Okay? The total change of linear momentum is the net force that you apply to the object. So then we have also our second result, which says that M naught is equal to Okay, so now I've also written the result that I have just tried. And, and, and we are done, right? So have a look here, right? So this is equal to that by the statement of Euler's laws of motion, right? So that is correct. And that zero, this term is equal to that. They cancel each other. So this term must be equal to that one. And that is our conclusion. So we're done. Oh, uh, no, sorry. That's just moments. Sorry. Thanks. All right. Now, again, results two and three hold in general. Right? Um, but let's go back to our goal of rigid body dynamics. What I'm trying to do essentially, eventually, one message is a simple description of how rigid bodies move, right? And we already have one result. Okay, so if you apply a certain force, then um, its total linear momentum is going to change, but that's nothing but mv bar dot, which is mx bar double dot, right? Um, so the acceleration of the center of mass. And this gives you a simple, so you exert a certain force. It's a simple equation with which you could update the position of the center of mass. Now, however, the rigid body will also change its orientation. I'd also like to have a simple equation that allows me to do that. That information must be in here, but it's not clear. Why is it not clear? Because here I have coordinates. I have three numbers which quantify and track the position of the center of mass, right? Now, how about orientation? How do I describe orientation, which is not eventually be going to be our goal, but eventually how does that orientation change with time? I don't see that here. To be able to see that, I need to somehow express 
as I've done for the linear momentum, right? So the linear momentum is mv bar. It's a very simple expression. The total mass of the object times velocity of the center of mass. So similarly, if I could somehow express the angular momentum about the center of mass in a simple manner through objects that have to do with the rigid body as a whole, then it would make my life easier. Why would it make it easier? Because otherwise, to calculate HCM, and I have to pull the board down at this point, I have to go ahead and do this integration. And I have to do this integration at every point in time. Because with time, these vectors are changing the relative position vector because the object is moving. So that will be costly okay, at every time step. Do an integral and find that object out. Instead, there should be a simpler way. Okay? And that simpler way is now going to be our goal. Again, the major idea here is to have a simple description of motion. I already have, for, I have it for the translational part, if you like. But for the rotational part, I don't see it yet. But it must be in there. Okay? So let's go ahead and manipulate um, V, total angular momentum. And we are, in fact, first going to show something about the rate of change of the relative position with respect to the center of mass. The Position with respect to the center of mass is something that appears in the definition or the calculation of the total angular momentum with respect to the center of mass. So if I'm interested in the rate of change of the total angular momentum, I'm interested in the rate of change of the position with respect to the center of mass. So I'm, in, I'm interested in this quantity, r bar dot. Okay? And we're going to show that r bar dot is some vector cross r bar, okay? which, of course, in, from your undergraduate mechanics, you will recall, uh, omega is nothing but the angular velocity. But now we are in a fully 3D setting, so this is going to be the angular velocity vector. Okay. And we should remember that it's a constant for r. Okay. So at any given time, uh, for the whole object, there is a single omega. Okay. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be useful. So that's our goal now. That's our goal. It's our goal to show that. So let me proceed with the results that we've obtained so far. This, so this is one of the results. The position with respect to the center of mass from the reference to the current configuration is subject to pure, pure uh, rotation. So I will also express it in an alternative manner by taking this to the left-hand side. That's an orthogonal tensor. So its inverse is equal to transpose. So that's another relation. Okay, I'll make use of both of them. So if you have so much, let's do the proof together because again, it's short. Right? I'd like to evaluate r bar dot. Okay, so that's equal to time derivative of that. R bar does not change with time; it's a referential quantity. So this is simply equal to q dot r bar. Now, instead of r bar, I'm going to write that. So I will have q dot q transpose r bar. Okay? Now, I want to concentrate on this tensor here because it's a special tensor. Okay? And let's observe that quickly. So um, q, q transpose is equal to identity. right? And now if I go ahead and take the time derivative of both sides, this is equal to 0. And that here is equal to q dot q transpose plus q q transpose dot or transpose of q dot. Okay, Transpose is a simple linear operation. I can take it outside of the dot. Okay, So that's what I have. This is the tensor that I'm interested in. And from this expression, I deduce that q dot q transpose is equal to minus q q dot transpose. But q q dot transpose is actually the transpose of q dot q transpose, right? So if you transpose this, you're going to obtain q q dot transpose. It's exactly this thing. I put it to the left-hand side. There is a minus sign. So if this is a tensor, then I take its transpose and I get its negative, which means that this tensor over here is 
skews metric. Okay, so this is a skew tensor, and let me call it capital omega. Okay, and let's say its axial vector is small omega, and therefore I can go up here. This is capital omega. And the definition of the axial vector is such that this operates on that is equivalent to taking the axial vector, crossing it with R bar. So that's the proof. Okay. Um, just to highlight omega, right, at any given time it belongs to the object, but with time that changes, right? So for instance, initially this object, let's say, is rotating like this. The axial vector is in that direction. Omega cross r will give you at any point the velocity of the object, of any point on the object, right, uh, as it rotates. Um, but now, so in, like it's like this presently, if the object also changes its orientation as it rotates, so that's an additional orientation. So at some instant later, let's say it continues to rotate like this, now the axial vector is in that direction. So it starts off in one direction, goes to another direction. So in general, it's something that changes with time. So if I have to worry about changing the uh, orientation and keeping track of the orientation of the object, and if at some point it proves useful to make use of this quantity, I have to keep in mind that its orientation is not a constant in time. I have to also worry about updating its orientation again. Just a small remark that we'll come back to, probably. OK, so let me proceed with the last proof of this lecture. And now what I'd like to show, now that I have the concept of a um, angular velocity vector, I'll show you that the total angular momentum with respect to the center of mass is expressible in terms of the angular velocity vector. And that's a vector, that's a vector. What goes in between is a tensor in general, and that tensor is called the inertia tensor. And in particular, it's the inertia tensor with respect to the center of mass. So the proof essentially entails deriving the expression for JCM. So if you like, watch and then write. You'll have time. If you like, write on the fly. Um, so. I'll go ahead and first express what the total angular momentum is. With respect to the center of mass, right? so it is the moment of the incremental momentum with respect to the center of mass. And now, let me also write V as uh, R bar dot plus um, v bar. Okay, so we can, let me move to this board to remind you that quickly. I'm trying to calculate the velocity of that point, that's v. That is the time rate of change of r bar plus the time rate of change of that vector, which is v bar. Okay, that's what I've written over there. Um, so I have um, integral over r, r bar cross rho r bar dot dv plus integral over r, right? So v bar is the velocity of the center of mass. For integration purposes, it's a constant. So within the integral, I'm going to preserve r bar. So there is a rho there as well, dv. And that thing as a whole is, that thing as a whole is crossed with v bar, OK? So this is equal to what? Okay. 
still too early. So x bar is the position of the center of mass. That's a constant that would come out of the integral rho dv m x cancel. So one term gives you simply x bar. And the remaining term is 1 over m integral rho x dv, which is? No, it's not a moment. I'm just looking at that term. 1 over m integral rho x dv. That is the definition of the position of the center of mass. That is x bar. So I have x bar minus x bar. So that's 0. Okay? So that term is equal to 0 because this term is 0. So, or you can interpret this term to be the mean position with respect to the center of mass. But center of mass is the mean position. So the mean with respect to center is 0 itself. Okay? So that's equal to identically 0. And I don't have to worry about that term. So we just concentrate on the first one. Okay? So that is equal to? r, r bar, and now I know what r bar dot is. So here I have omega cross r bar dv. I've made use of item 4. Okay. Good. So if you like, let me take, put this row over here. And now what I have is the cross product of a vector, cross product of the cross product of cross product of a vector with the cross product of two vectors, okay? And so that's like A cross B cross C, and I'll just recall an identity here, which you should, if you're not comfortable, go ahead and show yourself. That's the identity that I like to recall. So. If you have an expression like this, you can express it alternatively in terms of dot products as such. So A is R bar, C is also R bar, happens to be, and B is equal to omega. So I'll plug those in there and therefore show, making use of that, that this integral is equal to rho R bar, R bar, right? A and C are R bar, R bar dot R bar. omega minus r bar dot omega r bar db. Okay? I have to preserve the integral. Not, except for omega, nothing is a constant. Okay? Rho in general changes, r bar in general changes. Okay? So I have perhaps one dot too much here. So that is now the result that I will manipulate. And the way I will do it is as follows. I will just express it in a slightly different form. Um, and so first of all, I'll throw in an identity here. The presence of the identity doesn't change anything. And now I notice that I can take omega outside as such. So I'm going to throw in a large term here, integral over dB, and all of it will multiply omega. Now, I want omega to multiply a term, and as a result, I'd like to obtain that. Well, I already have it. It's r bar dot r bar identity, right? And then this term should be the result of omega operating on whatever is inside, and if I throw in r bar bond r bar, I conveniently obtain my goal, right? So, If I now define this to be JCM, I'm done. So I've shown that the total angular momentum with respect to the center of mass is a tensor multiplying the angular velocity vector. It's like a dot. It's not a dot. It's a bar. So in a similar fashion, by the way, we will define the, for instance, the uh, um, inertia tensor with respect to another point. So here it's with respect to the center of mass. So what we throw in 
is the position with respect to the center of mass. If you like to define it with respect to some other point, you put the relative position with respect to that point, and the expression itself uh, will still hold. Okay. So that's where we are so far. Do you have questions? So just to make a short link to what will immediately follow next time, it, it, we can have a look at this expression now. And I was talking about how we want to relate moment to orientation in a simple way. And orientation is implicitly embedded in this quantity that describes rate of uh, rotation. Uh, and then now there is, however, this other object. And that object is a tensor. Uh, but still, if I'd like to calculate what it is, this expression is neat. But the calculation of that thing entails an evaluation of an integral and the quantities in that integral uh, change continuously with time. So I don't want to calculate this at every point in time. What, what, what might be nice is I calculate it only once in the reference configuration and say, and then update it in a simple manner because I know that the object is only rotating. So in fact, you might expect that this is the rotation of the moment of inertia, the inertia tensor on the reference configuration. Okay? Because the object is only rotating, you calculate the inertia tensor once, and if you subject that tensor to rotation in the sense that we've described long ago what, for what it means uh, um, um, for a given tensor to, to rotate. Okay? So if you do that, then you calculate once and you keep updating. You don't have to keep evaluating that integral again and again. But that's what we're going to show next time. So far, at least, we now have some nice expression, neat expression, that relates a quantity that is related to the moment I'm applying to something that is conceptually easy to interpret and uh, also right, let's say. Okay. Okay, questions? All right, let's continue next time then.